Um, for our next presentation, we have Mr. Imaswe Amobie Izodua. He is an eloquent Benin historian from the ancient city of Benin. He, he is vast in the richness and culture and history of the Great Benin Kingdom. Mr. Izodua, welcome and thank you for joining us. So Imaswe, go ahead and explain or tell us more about the British punitive expedition of 1897. What exactly has exacerbated the war between the British people and Benin Kingdom? Good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to every participant of this amazing mm -hmm. uh, program, uh, Black History Month. And um, it also uses um, Avenue for us to discuss a bit about um, the Benin history. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this British expedition from a different angle uh, that I would like to call the emerging angle. All right, uh, in the sense that the history of British expedition has been largely told by those who propagated the barbaric act against the Benin people. And um, avenues like this create platforms for us to tell our side of what actually transpired um, in 1897. Presently, Benin artifacts are found in one estimated to be about 161 um, galleries and museums, uh, most especially in Europe and in North America. The relics of these artifacts scattered all over an estimated amount of about 161 galleries and outside the ones in private collections. The British was able to tell the people that houses or some of these museums that houses these artifacts from the outside of the story, how the British expedition came about, which they tagged the Benin Massacre. Benin Massacre in the sense that they told the world that of the nine government, British government representative to enhance the, the political ideology the then British people had in the Niger, Niger Delta Protectorate, um, seven of them, were dastardly murdered by the Benin people. But what they have refused to tell the world is the preempt idea behind conquering Benin. I'd like to take us back. There was an act that was provided in 1833 that abolished slave trading. Um, one of the top ranking political personnel in England had a press conference, delivered a lecture in Exeter Hall, June 1st, 1841. Wherefore he said that Africans should be divided amongst the European past. It was a move that mitigated the European past holding a conference in 1884, the yeah. popular Berlin Conference. Yes. African, African nations were divided like food or meats in the tables of the Europeans. Eventually, the section of African that was divided for the British people was West Africa. The territory now presently now occupied by present in Nigeria, situated in the heart of that country, Benin Empire. So there was already a prudent approach by the British with sets of conferences that they have had that this particular region of Africa must be taken over by whatever means. So it wasn't 
that the Benins were the one who created an avenue for the war. Whether there was a Benin massacre, which I will speak about in any moment from now, uh, there still would have been a war between the British and the Benin people because they were only interested in three capital things, which they call the three C's. Civilize these people, Christianize these people, and commercialize these people. So they were interested in bringing whatever they called civilization to this part of the people, to Christianize this part of the world, the people, because um, the Benin society is highly a traditional society. But in the video that was played, and, um, that, that video heard about two years ago, we talked about um, there was a time Benin Kingdom became a Christian nation, but it didn't last beyond 50 years. And it went back to the, the uh, Aboriginal concept of um, practicing of tradition. But however, the, the British were more interested in using this concept of civilizing these people, Christianizing these people, and making a whole lot of money from these people. So eventually, they sought out every mechanisms of making the then Oba, Oba of Vorame, to sign a treaty of handing over his vast empire and under the protection rights of Queen Victoria, who was the then queen at that time. Now, but you must, you must understand something very clearly. Now, the British had already done an exclusive finding of who the Benin people were, the core value, the things that made them who they are. So out of all the days of the year, they decided to come to Benin in the month of January. Now, January, the month of January in Benin, it's, um, it's quite a sacred month for the Oba of Benin because um, after the Igwe festival, it's an annual festival the Benin people uh, recognizes and, and uh, practice over the years at, at uh, a thanksgiving to God Almighty for having to lead them through throughout the year. So in the month of January, the Oba of Benin and some very selected nobles usually go into a fasting period which the Benin call Agwe. This was a time where the British came. It is, it's like I had said earlier, it was preempted. They were already aware that the Oba must go into a seclusion and not to receive any foreigner in the month of January. So that was the same month of January that they had sent emissaries to the Benin people that they were under some surveillance from the, the, the British government uh, because of the, the Niger protectorate that they wanted to, that they have created, they wanted to ensure because there was a peace treaty between the Obad of Benin and the British government. So from the request, the, the Benins had sent a counter request to them that the Obad of Benin was in seclusion, that it is customary for about 21 days that the Oba of Benin would not be able to attend to foreigners on, until the whole Agwe, uh, the seclusion of purity is over. But the British people insisted in seeing. So there was, there was a conflict at a community we now call Ugwine between the, the Benins, the Benin nobles and the British, all right? So that led to the murdering of seven out of the nine British emissaries at Ugwine, and eventually uh, two of them fled. Now, um, one thing, uh, what we should take very cognizance of, like I have said earlier, it wasn't as if um, uh, it was based on the Benin massacre, which they targeted uh, of uh, the Ugwine crisis in January 1997 that led to the war. The war was already preempted. The British had already made up their mind that the only way they can have a colony in the present day called Nigeria was to defeat the Benin Empire. Because uh, at about the time, there were conflagrations of um, um, a, a, a miniature kingdoms that existed that was first of all cut off. First, before, before 1897, 
take note. Um, the Ishekiri people, the, the, the leader of the Ishekiri group called Nana Olomo was also deposing. That was seven years before the British invaded Benin in 1897. So that was in, in, 18, in 1892. Prior before that time, the, the, the Lagos colony, the, the, what now eventually became Lagos colony was also, was also flanked out from Benin Empire. That was in 1851, where, where for the British had, had removed Oba Kosoko and replaced by Oba Akintoye, some, some of the kings in Lagos. Now, they were cutting some of the, 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 the locations, the locality where Benins had um, great influence over the, the trade markets, and they were also trying to cut all these people so as to get the alliances and get the bulk of the victory, which certainly was Benin. So eventually, when the massacre took place in 1897, January, precisely in 1897, it took the British less than a month to assemble all their warships. And um, I'm gonna read from an extra because I really wanted people to get to know uh, how prepared the British were. Ordinarily, it takes, it, it takes months to assemble the kind of warship that the British assembled. But however, it took them less than a month to assemble the kind of the warship they assembled because they were already aware that there was going to be war that has to take place. Probably before I go to, I read from the excerpt, um, I'd like to say something quite very cashy. After the war, after the war, basically, uh, a lot of things were written as to regard the war. We have series of writers, both from African descent and from European descent. Some allegedly said that Benin city was not plundered. Some allegedly said, even one of the writers had said that the, 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 the Benin Kingdom was not burnt down, that the time the Benin Kingdom was not burnt down in 19th century, that the Benin Kingdom was burnt down in 17th century, alleging to the incident that could have happened in one of the orbits of Benin called Obaogwebo. But however, they denied, except for some provincial uh, medical expert called Dr. Felix Roth, who had said in the work that was eventually uh, written or published by his younger brother, Lingrot, Henry Lingrot, uh, wherefore he said Great Benin, uh, he said so many despicable things about Benin to justify the barbarity of um, uh, the invasion of Benin. So, um, like I said, I was going to read something at um, some of the machineries that the British assembled to, to bring the war to Benin. Um, uh, th this was a work that was written by one of the renowned author, Ikagosa um, Aysen. I just quickly had to run through so that uh, we can understand um, how prepared they were, even when it was less than it was less than three weeks when the whole uh, Benin uh, Ugbenen massacre took place. Uh, from the South Atlantic Naval Station in Seamus Town, South Africa, seven warships were mobilized for the expedition. The warships were the St. George, named after the Patriot Saint of England. The warship served as a command headquarters of the expedition, being the flagship of Rear Admiral Harry Hotsworth Ronson, the commander in chief of the expedition. The other six warships from South Africa were the Magpie, the Philomen, the Foibs, the Aleto, the Wingeon, and the Barossa. The Barossa was at the island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic, the island where Napoleon Bonaparte, the defeated French emperor, had been exiled to by Britain and had died nearly a century earlier. Maintaining maximum speed continuously on her journey back home to Africa, she was able to rejoin her sister warships for the attack on Benin. From the British Mediterranean fleet at Anchor in Valletta, Malta, two washes, the Tessius and the Fort, were ordered to the Benin River with their full complement of the fighting sailors, the Blue Jackets. From military barracks in the cities of Portsmouth, 
Plymouth and Chatham in Britain herself, Marines were mobilized for the Benin expedition. In West Africa, troops of the Niger Coast Protectorate Force, based in Calabar, the capital of the Protectorate, were mobilized for the expedition. They consisted mainly of Hausa and, and Yoruba troops, commanded by white officers, including one black officer, Lieutenant Daniels. The force was taken to the Benin River from Calabar by the steamers, Loring, Eko, Elobi, and Lagoon. From Lagos Colony, a contingent of military scouts made up of Hausas and Yorubas of the Lagos Colony Constabulary were ordered to the Benin River. A trading ship, the liner Malacca, belonging to P&O Pacific and Orient, the equivalent of the, uh, the Dempster Lines of 50 years later, was commandeered in London that fitted out as a hospital ship for the Benin expedition. It was fitted out with operating theaters, 100 beds in inpatient, and an adequate number of naval doctors and nurses. It was sent to Benin River in support of the expeditionary force. Now, I was just trying to make us understand that uh, the preemptiveness of what the British had wanted to dissipate the Benin people so has to create uh, a colony of theirs at, um, has been agreed on in the 1884 Berlin Conference. So um, a lot of writers have written quite a whole lot, except for uh, modern European writers like uh, Robert Holmes. He, he had a book that was published in 1982, uh, uh, um, uh, The City of Blood Revisited, had, had not come in terms to understand that the war between the Benins and the British was preempted. It wasn't like, uh, the, the, it wasn't because the Benin massacred anybody in Ugbine. It was because they wanted to dissipate Benin so as to create a colony out of it, which eventually called Nigeria today. So it is a common saying that we always say that um, the defeat of Benin Kingdom led to the creation of a country called Nigeria. If the British had lost the war against the Benin people in 1897, I'm sure prior there wouldn't have been a country called Nigeria today. So and that is why they had to bring all the assets that they had to ensure that um, Benins um, were completely vaporized. Even when after the war was won, the British tarried in, in our city for a period of three to four years to ensure that every designing nobles or, or natives of Benin land were completely vaporized. And then the top of it was that um, an injustice, a, a kangaroo court was created in order, in order to exile our Oba, who, who, who was the, the, the leader of Benin people. And um, they, they made, uh, they made futuristic plan to ensure that um, uh, uh, the Oba of Benin never returned and his lineage, his lineage um, was supposed to be denied, was supposed to be denied to ever returning back as, as the king of Benin. But however, the summary of it uh, um, is that um, there was a war, uh, a pre-planned war, the war that the British had already planned against the Benin people uh, for, for several reasons. I, I think there was an airsub that was, re, that was, that was wrote by one, um, one and Laura Mariam, which said that, and it was visualized that the, the artifacts that they saw precisely 1862, I need to quickly give this account. Um, there was a man called Richard Bolton, Richard Bolton, he, he was first a trade, British trade merchant in the island of Fernando Po. He came to Benin in the year 1862. He was on assignment to, to statutorily uh, uh, estimate the cost of the artifact, whether it will, it will suffice for the armory they were going to use in, in completely dissipating the Benin people. So it was like the cost of what the cost, the, the financial, the cost implication of what it would take the British 
to dissipate the Benin people was already estimated somewhat about is that 87, somewhat about 35 years earlier by one of their British professor, an archaeologist and an anthropologist and an historian, uh, uh, Professor Richard Biotin. And now, uh, when the war was eventually brought to the Benin, the artifacts were carted away. And this is the same artifact that has generated hundreds of millions yearly to the British and to private and collectors that were kept by some of the uh, people who were part of the contingent, uh, the military contingent that invaded Benin and then and completely destroyed Benin. And um, the story goes on forth and on and how Benin has to rebuild the empire that they once had for a period of almost 900 years has to be rebuilt from afresh. And, um, and that's the situations that we have found ourselves. So I'll just end here so that there can be room for questions and uh, so my sections can close up. Thank you very much. So, okay, go ahead. Thank you so much, Mr. Imaswe. I am uh, excited that I'm on here to learn. I think one of the things that I wanted to make sure I did today was get the facts right, especially from a historian as yourself. Um, we'll circle back with, to you with questions as we keep moving forward. Um, Okay, so let's go to the uh, discussion session. Uh, if anybody has a question to ask Imaswan Izodua about the, the British and Benin War, go ahead. Hi, Mr. Um, Izodua, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I can hear. Great. Um, the question I have is not as related to um, the war, but I wanted to know what your comparison is as it relates to the present day situation that we live in. Do you think that colonialism is still lingering on? Do you think that we're still guided by the colonial mindset? And if yes, why? And then my second question is, um, as regards to the artifacts that were taken away from the great uh, Benin Kingdom, um, what, what processes and what step, where are we at today trying to get them back? Thank you. Uh, the two traditional rulers that was placed to sit beside Prince Charles was the Sultan of Sokoto and the Oni of Ife. All right, followed by Emine of Zazau, uh, or B of Anicha, Emine um, of Kanu, then lastly, the other of Benin. Then one, Nana asked, there was an opera that for the kind of achievement by peculiarity of greatness in the time in the pre-colonial times over of Benin ought to be number one i'm not here I'm not using this medium to do classifications of who is superior uh, amongst all the kings in nigeria this is not an intention my intention is to make you understand the colonial concept that was used in creating Nigeria in the post-colonial era is still prevailing. Now that's because the sitting arrangement gives a clue of how the colonial masses handed over this country to some certain tribes, the Fulani, the Yorubas, and the Igbos. Now, the country Nigeria still operates in the same cycle of what the colonial masses have taught them or imbued in them. So, and that was the essence of the sitting arrangement that occurred a few years ago when Prince Charles visited. So in, in the minds of the British, they still see that the political structure of this country belongs to the Fulani, then the Yorubas, and then the Igbos. So not the pre-colonial setting of who the then the Benins were, who the then the Yorubas were, who the then the, uh, the Fulanins were, not minding the fact that the Fulanins came into the country 
about 19th century. So the concept of colonialism still persists in most, if not all, African countries today. Now, that is as a result of the dictates of the leadership, um, the, the leadership of the African leaders. They have continued to operate within the concept of the colonials, the colonial ideology that was left behind when they were still around. So if you want to ask me, are there still colonial ideology in present in Africa, most especially in Nigeria, the answer is a big yes. And I tried to portray it with an example amongst several. Then I will just quickly go straight to the second question. The second question was, what is being done to, to retrieve um, the stolen artifact? What has been done to, re uh, to retrieve the stolen artifact? Uh, tragically, tragically, um, we are still where we are today. But I am very optimistic with the recent upsurge in genuine Benin people or world leaders who are now beginning to understand the great injustice that the British people did to the Benin people are doing everything humanly possible for the repatriation of the stolen artifact. And again, um, I heard the, the, the Royal Palace of the Over of Benin in conjunction with some other groups. I think uh, the leader of the Baco group, it's also another group uh, in which the leader is in is in Germany, it's also here. It also has a group that um, are advocating for the return of the Benin artifact. And there are quite several other groups. I had some groups in the United Kingdom that have also reached out to me that they are also doing all they can for the restoration, for the return, repatriation of the stolen artifact. But my fear is this, my fear is this, is that the, the group that tends to be at the forefront of them I've had a treaty or whatsoever uh, with the British government and aligned the British government also determining the terms and condition at which some of these other parts should be returned. And I heard it was in the news. I tried to counter it, and I want to say my mind again, that um, we're giving terms and conditions like They are going to they are going to borrow us our artifact. And I was like, ain't we still be the word new colonialism still prevail? Like the question that you asked. If you if you agree that you stole some certain things from someone, you agree that you stole things from someone, what it is normal, the norm, the norm, the normal thing you're supposed to do is to return those things without any terms and condition. Now they are given terms and condition that they are going to borrow us. Now, if we'll agree to such arrangement, it therefore gives them a futuristic leverage to say that they are the owner of the artifacts because you can, when you are, it's only when you own something that you can borrow it. So, and I don't really, I don't want to devote so much into some of these things. So I'm just going to pause it here, but I don't really know the kind of arrangement that would have mitigated to the British having a sort of an agreement with the Benin people under the guise of whatever institution that our artifacts that was done by ancestors, brilliant ancestors, should be borrowed back to the supposedly owners. So, but mm -hmm. they have been moved. They have been moved, great move for the return of the artifact. I think I'll end. Thank you. Thank you, Imasue.